Hello, everyone. Uh, this is Al Fadi, and I'd like to welcome you back to another uh, episode of this series on the Piraat and uh, the controversies surrounding that. Uh, we have been covering a lot of grounds in terms of uh, issues related to the so-called Ahruf and Qiraat, myself and Dr. J. Smith, who have done a, an amazing job, of course, laying out for all of you and all of us, uh, and myself included, uh, you know, an amazing timeline, uh, which is very helpful for you uh, to understand now when we talk about that gap, the 100 year or 200 years gap between the time of Muhammad and things becoming more fixed and developed. And the Qiraat issue is no different. Uh, last time we talked about uh, the so-called 30 Qiraat. Yes, you heard me correctly. 30, you can call them 30 different uh, versions of the Quran. Today's episode going to ask a unique question. Were there even more than 30? And of course, with me here in the studio is Dr. Jay Smith. Dr. Jay, thank you so much, as always, for being here. And this is the question, were there more than 30? Well, that, I mean, Kira'at. that's the question I yeah. would have never suggested, and I would never have even surmised well, two and a half months ago. Uh, we didn't know about this. I've, this. Much of this material has come to light because of Dr. Shadi Hekmuk Nasser. Uh, Dr. Shadi Nasser has, uh, did his doctoral thesis in 2012, where he unpacked much of this material. No one really paid that much attention to it outside of academic circles at Harvard University where he's at until this admission by by uh, Dr. Yasser Qadi on June 8th. Now suddenly we're all interested in these Qiraats and we've always assumed there were only those 30. If you go up on Wikipedia or if you go up into Britannica Encyclopedia, you will see the 30 are listed there. Mm -hmm. And we thought, Okay, that's the 30. You have the 7 plus the 3, that's 10. And then you have 2 for each one of them, which makes another 20. There's the 30. Right. And assum assumption is this was all closed at the time of the Mujahid. And we, then we found it wasn't closed at the time of Mujahid. Ibn Mujahid there was, yeah. an, there was yeah. another There was another 9 that were added by Al-Jazari in 1429, in the 15th century. Now, from what Shadi Nasser is telling us, is, is there is a reason why those 30 had to be picked. And the reason why is that 200-year period from the 8th, 9th, and 10th century, there is a litany of Qur'ans. Mm -hmm. What are we talking about? Well, let's go back and let's go to the slide again. Uh, let's put the slide back up there. And there you can see the Qirat Conundrum. There you can see Muhammad died in, nine, in 632, Uthman. Uh, introduced his Qureshi Quran in 652. And of course, uh, w reminding ourselves of the 10 readings, there are the 10 readings there. The three uh, red ones at the bottom, which come later, the seven early ones at the top, those are the green ones. Uh, those were chosen by Ibn Mujahid, and the ones at the bottom were chosen by Al Jazari. And then uh, we have the followed by the 20 narrators. So there are the 20 narrators, uh, those are the tw purple ones. And I've circled the two most important watch and huffs in black. Now, the question is, were there more? Yes, right. there were many, many more. And Shadi uh, Hekmak Nasser, transmission of the variant readings of the Quran. Let's see what he says. And he says the transmission uh, the between the time that the initial 8th century reader, Ibn Ahmed, we talked about him dead yesterday from Correct. Damascus, he was the first one in 736, created his Qirat Quran, and the 10th century, when the original seven readers were appointed, by Ibn Mujahid, we have an intervening 200 years, 736 to 936. In those 200 years, there were many other transmitters known as rawis, or students, or narrators, or transmitters, whatever word you want to give to that word. Right, and obviously there's a reason why he's saying students or narrators, because not all of them were really living at the same time with the reader himself. So if they were with them, maybe they were students, but some of them came later and narrated that. Some of them came later, some of them, you're right. Yeah. And so they're in the, what I would like to say is they're in the same family uh, or in the same stable. I'm sure, I mean, family of manuscripts maybe, family and, of readings. Well, yeah. Even that is a misnomer because if they were yeah. in the same family, they should be exactly the same. That's true, that's so, true, there you and go. that we're I gonna mean, show is not the case. Exactly. But let's go back, exactly. he says, in fact, there were so many that this became a crisis, forcing Ibn Mujahid to appoint just two transmitters for each of the Th uh, seven canonical readers. Let's review that. There you can see the review that we've just talked about. So there they are, uh, Al Jazari and Ibn Mujahid. Between the two of them, they, we now have 30. But we find that there were other scholars beside Ibn Mujahid 
who chose the Rawis from the initial seven readers. What are we talking about? Well, let's go to Aldani. Aldani, he died in 1053. So you're talking about 100 years after Ibn Mujahid. You have this fellow who has a number of, of Rawis. Take a look at this. And by the way, I want to mention to people, Adani is a great deal when it comes to recording the different uh, Mus'haf or Qurans. Okay, in what way? Uh, he, he was talking about these kind of issues. You know, they were different. He called them Mus'haf, uh, meaning Qurans, plural. Okay, that were Mus'haf different. Means, means manuscript, really, as well. Yeah, Mus'haf codex, you know, codex if you wish. what we would call a, a physical codex. It's, this is not a recitation now. Right. Okay. And, and the only problem with that is, as you notice, he's 11th century, and yet there is a lot of scholars sometimes rely more on his work when, in fact, the guy was a late, uh, you know, basically edition versus early ones. He would have agreed with the first 10, just like Mujahid. Yeah. What does he do with the Rawis? Take a look at this. Yeah. So, for Nafi, you have four Rawis. For Ibn Kathir, three Rawis. For Abu Amr, two Rawis. For Ibn Amir, five Rawis. For Asim, four Rawis. For Hamza, one Rawi. For al Kisai, five Rawis. That's a total of 24 Rawis, narrators or transmitters. That's 10 more than Mujahid. So there is not an agreement here. Why haven't we heard this before? So now we have 40. Now we have 40 right. on top of that. Now, let us he's right. not still not the only one. There's another one. Now we find that there is this guy here. Uh, let's bring him up, another scholar, and his name is Abu Ali al-Maliki. Now, he is born, uh, well, died, I'm sorry, in 1046. So he, another 11th century. 11th century, about 100 years after Ibn Mujahid. Yeah. He has a completely different list of Rawis. Let's look at it. For Nafi, he has four. Rawis. Ibn Kathir, two Rawis. Abu Amr, three Rawis. For Ibn Amir, two Rawis. For Asim, two Rawis. Hamza, four Rawis. Al Qasai, eight Rawis. That's a total of 25 Rawis, narrators or transmitters. That's 11 more than Ibn Mujahid. So one has 10 more, the other one has 11 more. Do you know, because I don't want to make any assumptions right now, do you know of any of his Rawis overlap some, with Some of them do Danny's. overlap, so we have to be okay. careful. These okay. are not an, in addition to. Okay. But hold on, hold on a minute. Uh, that may be the case. I just want to show you that the lists were not, Ibn Mujahid is not the only one. He was the one that was uh, sanctioned, uh, it's not sanctioned, was canon became the canonical. Of the 10 reader, uh, of, of the seven readers, I should say. And he was the one that added another. Uh, he, he was the one that added another fourteen. Al Jazari is not even in the picture yet. Al Jazari comes not. He doesn't come till fourteen hundreds. So right. don't even put him into this picture. So the other three plus the other six have yet to come into this picture. Right. But what I'm saying is Ibn Mujahid canonized the seven readers plus two narrators. Rawis for so each that's, one of that's those. That's the fourteen. Seven, that that's you're the fourteen. About. So we're talking yeah. about twenty. Right. Uh, we're talking about twenty-one. Correct. By. So these guys have another list. Beyond that 21, they have other lists of mm -hmm. others. But to, just to let people know, so there is a lot of discontinuity. There's a lot of uh, miscommunication here. And that's why you can understand why then Ibn Mujahid had to be the one that was chosen. You can then understand why in the 11th century, they then raised his uh, canonic, canonical 21 to almost divine status. Mm -hmm. It was because, in contradistinction, they had to have one that was the the, the best of the best, the creme de la creme that that, uh, yeah. that Yasser Qadi is always talking so about. So, Dr. J, well, I think there is one theme we keep seeing popping up over and over again. Regardless of who tries their best to fix the issue, like Uthman, something pops up a century or two later. Ibn Mujahid tried his best to canonize. Still, a century later, we still have problems. Okay. And when he tried to do something, and, and I, you know, give him give him credit, he wanted to try to, because there was all kinds Contain of chaos. It, yeah. There Contain, was chaos yeah. as to what with all these different guys, and everybody was claiming to be the best of the best. He Correct. had to then make it, put his thumbprint down and said, no, these are the seven. And then these are the 14. Even though he didn't consider them to be divinely inspired. Not at all. In fact, he would yeah. never have said that these are from Muhammad even. There you go. But a century later, when you have all these other lists coming up, the others have said, we've got to decide who is, who are the canonical ones. And that's why they put, the, that's why they elevated Ibn Mujahid's list. And that's why they gave his list a divine status. And you wonder why we say it's a man-made. It's all man-made. This yep. is all man-manipulated. This is all man-injuncted. And that's why for, uh, when Muslims are making the claims they're making to the claim today, they don't know this history. They need to go back to this history. So let's go back then to how these, they chose their canonical rawis, what you're asking for. 
Now, usually they did this by the largest number of students who came after them, which means whoever was the most popular. Is, is that the way you do textual criticism? No. Uh, in textual criticism, of course, there are a number of criteria. I'm going to just share a few. You look at the family of manuscripts, like you said, mm -hmm. right? That's, uh, the, the, the amount or the weight of the manuscript is important. Uh, you look sometimes at the phrases. Uh, shorter, more complex sayings or phrases are considered to be original more so than the easier ones okay. to read. Right now, I hope yeah. everybody's listening, so you're looking at the text. Exactly. Textual criticism, by definition, is should the involve the text. Exactly. So you're looking at the text, you're reading the text, you're comparing the text, you're, look, you're discerning f uh, from the written text that's in front of you certain criteria. That's and the correct. criteria is, does it match to that which is the earliest? Exactly. You always go back exactly. to that which is the earliest. If you have the original, better. But if you don't have the original, you go to that which is closest to the original, right. by definition. So this is not happening here at all. There is no reference anywhere that I can see of anybody looking at the text and even comparing whether or not these rawis, whether or not they correspond with the readers that they are that they are attributed to. That's true, and I want to add even another wrench into this whole the debacle right now. I mean, it was okay to keep going back to Uthman's time, but now we have something called the Sana manuscripts and something similar to it, which means that the gap between the time of Muhammad and the time when Uthman did what he supposedly did, we have readings that are different. Yeah. Yeah. So what do yeah. we do with that? Okay, that's that's un, that's yet to come. That's yet yeah. uh, that's material that we're going to be introducing in another of a month or so. Let's go back to this. these rawis. These rawis in biblical textual criticism, we've always used the textual analysis of looking at the text, seeing if it corresponds, see if there are de uh, derivations or there, de uh, there are tra uh, things go off in a tangents. If they are, we throw them out. If in doubt, throw them out. Now, where do you think that phrase came from? That was came from the whole context of how you put together the, the biblical text. Mm -hmm. Now, that has not been done with the Quran, and it's certainly not been done here. What was done here was who is the most popular? You want to get the most popular. What does that mean? Well, you want to look at how many students they had or how many people that came after, how many strands. And you keep on hearing about in their writings. And Nasser uh, brings this up. Shadi Nasser, all the different strands. You look at all the, whoever has the most strands, he's the one that is chosen. If you only have a single strand, you throw them out because he's not popular. But what does it mean, strand? It doesn't mean whether or not their text was the same. It has nothing to do with what their text would correspond with each other. It was who was the most popular, who had the most students, who had the most followers. Now, uh, was politics and honor and family name involved in here? Absolutely, it was. Yeah. It really came down to yeah. who had the most prestige, who, had, who had, uh, people went after. Now, question I went. How do we know if any of these rawis between the 8th and 10th century had anything comparable to the readers they are associating with? Has anybody done that work yet? And I'm asking Muslims, have, do you know of anybody that's done that kind of work? Looking and seeing whether you have any of these, and I've got them right here, any of these guys here, Warsh and Kalu, did, there, did they match what Nafi said? Has anybody looked to see whether Kunbul or Bazi matches what Ibn Kathir, who is the reader for them? Has any from Al-Susi or Dur Duri match what Abu Amr and Kandi Judah? Any of these Varawis, do they match? Is the Hafs that we use today, is his the same as Asim? We're going to get into that. I mean, That's yet to come. Uh, uh, you know, I don't want to also throw another uh, wrench into it, but you and I know that there's at least seven different Hafs traditions. Exactly. There you go. Hatun has been able to collect, collect all seven of them. Yeah. And we're going to show a picture of that. But that's for another episode. We're going to come to that in time. Now, sure, let's look at Warsh. Because if they're the most popular, you would have thought that Warsh would be on this line. So what we're finding, and let's look at Warsh. Because Warsh, this guy right here, Let's get the right one. Here is Warsh. Let's put it right side up. Okay, Warsh there. This guy who writes or dies in 812, so he's the ninth century. His is very popular all over North Africa. But he is, he is in the family of Nafi, who comes from Medina. So is Warsh from Medina? No, no he's not. No, of course not, yeah. Where is, do you know where Warsh is from? I can't recall now, was he Kufa? Egypt. Oh, Egypt. He is okay. Egypt. He's not from Basra. He's not from Kufa. He's not from Damascus. He is Egypt. So if he is in Egypt, then what is he doing in Nafi's uh, family? Because in Nafi's family, 
there should there are two others that are much more authoritative. One is called Ismail ibn Jafar, and the other one is called Al Musayyabi, who have many more lines after them, much more popular. They, along with Kalun, are the three major rawis that come in the line of Nafi. They are all from Medina. So, what in the world is Warsh doing there? So the the guys in Medina who were at least you can say at the epic center of when the Quran came from, technically, Mecca and Medina, were not selected as, as popular as Warsh, who was in North Africa. Exactly. And why was Warsh selected when he only has a few strands that come after him, was not very popular, did not agree with Nafi in his recitate or in his uh, Quranic text? The reason he was chosen is because of the fact that they needed somebody from Egypt. That was the only reason. So this had nothing to do with popularity. It had everything to do with geography. Also, remember Aldani that you mentioned earlier? Aldani went and studied under one of the students of Warsh, and so he put him, a Warsh in his list. So that's why then they went to go ahead and they gave Warsh his accolades and put him as one mm -hmm. of the two Rawis that belonged to Nafi. And they threw out Ismail ibn Jafar and al Musayabi. Fascinating. So it has nothing again to do with textual uh, credence or credibility or authority. It has nothing to do with whether or not they even match each other. It had everything to do with either popularity or it had to do with geography, which in this case was for political yeah, reasons. So, so let, let me, let me uh, draw an attention to something. Our Muslim friends always attack Luke and they say, oh, wait a minute. Luke uh, uh, wasn't really in contact with Jesus. Well, of course, we don't know. I mean, that, that's an assumption. But they have a problem with Luke, who was in Jerusalem also. He was with the Apostle Paul. He was with other apostles. He had collected from eyewitnesses. They mm -hmm. have a problem with that. But they don't have a problem with Warsh, who had nothing to do with anything and was only in a certain area far away just to make sure that we covered our geographical regions with readers. And I love, I love this, uh, you're doing this as an example, because yeah. when you look at the anecdotal evidence, what we do now know about Luke is that he is probably the most authentic because of the fact he would always name places, dates, and events. He used more historical data than any right. other of the writers exactly. because that was what he was interested in. That's why he has given us probably more authority and a credence for the right man at the right place doing the right thing at the right time, which is what you need for historical criticism. And that's why Luke in the book of Acts and also in the Gospel of Luke is by far the most credible, giving and showing that you have to have these these writings in the first century and no other time. Uh, the, uh, and so when you do the same thing with Waters, nothing of this is even asked. No one asks these type of questions. Is he writing the right thing? Does he have the right material? Is he having the right text? Does he have the right dates, names, and places? No historical application has ever been given to Waters, and yet Waters is the second of all of the Gerahats that are used today, the second most popular oh, that yeah, is used absolutely. today. Oh yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Mean, all uh, in North Africa, why? Because he's from North Africa. He's from Egypt. <laughs> right, right. Good man. So let's continue on. So these are the intermediate rawis. How are how many of these intermediate rawis were there? Do you want to show the slide by the let's way? Let's go back to the slide now yeah. and let's go back. And here's the question. Let's see what Nasser shows us. And when you go back to Nasser, I'm going to show you a number of graphs here because when you look at these graphs, this is something that comes from his own research. Uh, let's look at the first one and let's look at Ibn Kathir. So here's Ibn Kathir. He is from Mecca. Uh, he uh, died in 738. Ibn Mujahid died in 936. So you're talking almost exactly, we're talking almost exactly 200 years later. And this came from Dr. Nasser's book, Nasser's by the way. way. This is yeah. from his, this is his, these are his graphs. And, and folks, I tell you, he, he did an amazing work. Uh, so I encourage you to go and get his book. Okay, I've got circled there uh, Ibn Kathir. That's circled Ibn Kathir. Let's go ahead and circle also Ibn Mujahid. I want to look at those two circles because what's in between those two circles are a bunch of names. See all those names and see all the threads? Those are the threads we're talking about. So what are the most extensive threads? Look at the two ones in red, and I'll just Ibn Kathir them. is the reader, not he is Ibn the reader. Kathir the commentator. No, this is another one. Yes. Be careful, we're not talking about the Ibn Kathir who right. is from the exactly. Tafsir. This is Ibn Kathir who is the, the reader from, right. uh, from 738. There is Al-Bazi and there is Kunbul that I've circled in red. Correct. Those are the choose, though two that Ibn Mujahid chose, just those two. Out of how many? out of 59 different rawis, at the rawis. That means 59 different writers of the Quran. That means all of which would have been written down at that time. Between the, the 8th and 10th century, 59 different transmitters wrote 59 different derivations of the Quran, all in the family of Ibn Kathir, and only two were chosen out of these 59. They th he threw the other 57 away. Now, did you know this before, the, before today? 
uh, before reading his book and going through this? Of course not. There's a lot of these things that you grow up in a Muslim country, and you're not taught any of this, by the way. You just, you're told, okay, yeah, sure, there is Warsh, there is Hafs, but, but the, this is what the Prophet basically read. Okay, that's, that's Ibn Kathir. That's just yeah. one of the ten. Let's yeah. go now to Nafi, the one we've just been talking about from Mecca. I'm sorry, from Medina. There you have Nafi, uh, and he dies in 785. And let's put his, circle his name up there. And there's Ibn Mujahid at the bottom. Mm -hmm. So how many, uh, well, who is it the one that he, uh, he chooses? Well, he chooses Kalun, who is from Medina. And Ibn Mujahid chooses Warsh, who is from Egypt. Mm -hmm. But he should have chosen Ismail or Musayabi, who are over to the left. What's fascinating, how many did he have to choose from? Well, he had 63 different Qirat Rawis. I mean, Qurans. you have Yaqub ibn Jafar. He's connected to Nafia, connected to Medina. I mean, uh, at least he has more sources than Warsh himself. Look at Ismail ibn Jafar to the left. I maybe should have circled them, but you can see Masyabi who are to the left of Warsh. Those are the ones they should have chosen, much more popular, better known. They were uh, uh, dismantled and Warsh was chosen in their place because he was from uh, another city. But look at the 63. I'm like, uh, re reading your focus on exactly how many we're talking about. So let's go to another one. Here is Abu Amr from Basra, 770 when is when he dies. Let's go ahead and circle him. Ibn Mujahid down here at the bottom again. Let's see how many he has. Well, before we look at that, he chose Al-Duri, which is uh, there circled in red, and also Al-Susi. Those are the two he chooses, and because, again, they have many more strands. They're more popular. This has any, nothing to do with ability. This has nothing to do with textual credibility. It has everything to do with political situation as to who is the ones that creates has the most after him. How many does he have that he could have chosen? 65. 65 different Qurawi's Qurans that he could have chosen. He threw out 63 and only chose these two. This is starting to add up, isn't it? Absolutely. Let's go one more. I just want to give you one more. And this is Asim from Kufa. He dies in 745. There's Asim's name circled and Ibn Mujahid down at the bottom. Take a look at all those names. Every one of those names. They're so small, you can only, I can't read them. Because you get to get them all in one graph, there's so many of them. Who are the ones that he chooses? Well, he chooses Shuba and he chooses Hafs. Those are the two that are circled in red. So how many could he have chosen from? 91, 91 different Kirat Rahis, different Qurans. Each one of them would have been a different Quran. He chose only Shuba and Hafs. Now, let's go and take a look at our conclusions here. First of all, the Qirats between Ibn Kathir and Ibn Mujib are 59. The Qirats between Nafi and Ibn Mujahid are 63. The Qirats between Abu Amr and Ibn Mujahid are 65. The Qirats between Asim and Ibn Mujahid are 91. That's a total of 278 different Qirats. Uh, basically, you're talking about 278 different Qurans just from those four. But remember, we have 10 of them. These are just four out of 10. So if you take uh, the average of four uh, of the 278 is 70, and you multiply that times 10. You're talking about almost 700 different written Qur'an Qurans that could have that we could have had today. The all of the except for uh, 670 of them were thrown out and only retained the 30 that we have today. Now I never heard this until this year. I wasn't even aware of this. I've heard of Shadi Nasr. I hadn't read it, uh, but it was Colin who got me onto this. He said, Jay, you need to read this stuff. So that's why I'm sharing this with you. This is nothing that I've come across, and I've never heard Muslims talk about this. Why don't Muslims talk about this? Why aren't Muslims making this public? Why aren't Muslims telling people like Muhammad Hijab, you've got a real problem here. If you think 30 is bad, what about 700? So when he put his hand out there to Yasser Qadi and said, which one are you going to put there? There could be a possibility of 700 that he could put there. And when Yasser Qadi says, well, it's, they're all of them. All 700? Just by looking at 23 of the 700, we've come up with 93,000 differences. Can you imagine the number of differences we could come up with if we had access to all the 700? Goodness sakes, I'm so glad I don't have to defend this. No wonder we're talking about holes in narratives. This is a huge hole, a hole that's 700 times multiplied. And that's why, can you then understand why Yasser Qadi says, we do not talk about this in public. Take my class. And I would like to know if even Yasser Qadi is aware of this. Is he aware of these 700? Did he know? I'll be surprised if Yasser Qadi doesn't know about the work of uh, Shadi Nasser, but who knows? 
Maybe he is. Thank God we don't have this problem with the Bible. Thank God we don't make these claims. Thank God we don't say that there has only been one Bible that was sent down exactly as, as we have today to Jesus Christ, and he wrote it down, no, or he had it written down. No, we don't make these type of claims. But see, the Muslims do. And that's why you, when you hear Shad, uh, Nasa Qadi get up say there has not been one word, not one letter, that there's only been one Quran. We know it's preserved. When he goes into his mantra, he's, he's sitting there and he's just saying, I don't want to be, uh, I do not want to be confused with the facts. But we're looking at him and he's an emperor with no clothes. Mm -hmm. he, this is the emperor with no clothes. Folks, we're exposing him. They don't have anything. They're not wearing a thing. They are actually exposing themselves because they're not looking at the historical record. That is correct. And folks, um, uh, this this type of info, um, Jay is not kidding. Uh, this is groundbreaking for the vast majority of people in the Muslim world, but even for everybody in the world. I assure you that not a whole lot of people spend time or invest energy to know about these things. And here we are uh, putting it to you in a very simplified fashion in a way that makes perfect sense. So use it with our, your Muslim friends. And if you're a Muslim watching this, challenge your leaders who keep telling you you have the Quran that was revealed to the Prophet of Islam. Which Quran? Which Quran? Uh, uh, the, the, the one Quran, 10 Qurans, 70 Qurans, 30 Qurans, 700 Qurans. Which Quran? Please tell me which one out of all of these came from heaven. That's the main question. Mm -hmm. Jay, what are we going to cover next time? We're going to start because the, one of the claims that has come up over and over again is that these don't change any meaning. These don't change any doctrine. This is nothing really important. Uh, they're just pronunciation differences. They're different dialectical. They're different recitational differences. This is what uh, Dr. Shabirali always goes on and on and on and says. There's no difference in meaning or doctrine or practice or belief. We're going to look at some of these. We're not going to look at a lot because, we listen, there's 93,000 of them. Uh, we, there's no time to go through all 93,000. But just to give you an idea of what we're talking about, these do change the meaning. And in and some cases, even the practice. The 93,000 were out of how many so out far? Out of just 23 so far. 23 out of the 37? Out of the 30 that are official. Or 30, got, right. 37 that she has, you're right. Uh, but we just haven't had time. And this is why I'd love to say, why aren't Muslims doing this? Why do we have to do it? Well, that's uh, classic, by the way. Uh, always the Orientalists in their mind do the work for them, and they only pick the ones that prove the Quran to be okay. Or support their right. agenda, or support right. their narrative. That's right. Very good. Well, thank you so much for uh, amazing work, you and your team. And I'm really blessed uh, to uh, be uh, among maybe the, the first uh, to share this kind of information uh, with our people. Thank you so much for being here with us. And uh, until we meet you next time, have a blessed day. Thank you for watching this video. Be sure to like and subscribe to our channel, Sierra International. Also, click on the bell so that you can receive notifications whenever we publish a new video or we go live. And I would like to appeal to you to consider becoming a Patreon patron by clicking on the link right below. And that way you can give towards the production of these videos. There are also other options for you on how you can give to our channel. So thank you from the bottom of my heart.